joined now by a panel of incredible entrepreneurs uh, who, with their leadership, are going to inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs and empower us all to imagine the possibilities ourselves and uh, make sure that we are making the most of all of our American dreams of entrepreneurship. So I want to welcome up our incredible panelists. Uh, let's start first by welcoming back Natalie. Uh, Natalie, of course, founder of Dunamis. And then we also have Payal Kadakia, who is the founder and former CEO of ClassPass. And then Melissa Butler, CEO of Lip Bar. Woo. And um, of course we have Sarah Blakely, the founder and former CEO of Spanx. Woohoo! Wow, I mean, this is an incredible panel. And I think, you know, in the audience, we have uh, successful entrepreneurs that I've met in my travels from manufacturing to restaurants, to you name it, our incredible women's business centers and our incredible advocates uh, for capital access that women need so much. Uh, you know, and I think that, uh, but we're gonna get to experience really, uh, you know, and, and your experiences and your insights, especially for those 10 and a half million new businesses out there and the half of them that are women because, uh, you know, just going back, you've managed, you've launched and you've grown and you've managed thriving businesses. Uh, but I think if you can take us back too to some of those early days uh, in your organizations and tell us a little bit more about a moment when you faced an enormous challenge and what you did, because I think to get to know how you got through it, uh, how that changed the way you operated, uh, and you know, at that point, when you knew that you'd finally just make it through anything after that challenge. But let's please start to share just a little bit more about your experience. And Sarah, do you want to kick us off? Sure, I'll kick you off. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I would say, you know, I think the first big challenge that most entrepreneurs face is getting the product made. And at the time, I was a 27-year-old girl from Clearwater Beach, Florida, with no business experience, driving around North Carolina, begging a bunch of men who owned the factories and made all of our undergarments to help make my idea. And um, it may sound cliche, but I think one of the reasons I actually got one of the factory owners to make my product was my own passion and my own determination. He literally, I got rejected from everyone. They all sent me away and this one factory owner called me and he said, Sarah, I don't understand this product you wanna make. I really don't even get it, but your passion and your determination that this is something that you really like has stuck with me and I'm gonna give you a chance. And so that, that was a big um, obstacle that I had to overcome, but it's always for me in the beginning, it was press. How are people gonna learn about what I'm making? and then where is it gonna be sold? And so I made a list of everywhere that I could get free press because I had no money to advertise. And number one on my list was Oprah Winfrey and the Oprah Winfrey show. So I started sending my product to Oprah and I got a chance to be on her show, which was a, a huge solve and unlock for me. Amazing. amazing. And then when I got into all the major department stores, Neiman Sachs Nordstrom was such a big deal. I realized very quickly that my biggest challenge was where I was sold in the store. They put me in the sleepiest corner of the store. And so I think a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, you think you get the big order or the big opportunity and you've arrived, and that's when the hard work starts. And so I spent two years going um, to every department store in the country and selling the product for them in their own stores. And I took it out of the hosiery department, set up a table in the entrance, and flashed my Spanx to everybody who came in the door. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa? So I think small businesses, particularly women in this country, you know, we don't, we don't know what we don't know. And so I started my business in such a scrappy way. I was working on Wall Street and I was so frustrated with the beauty industry. It's lack of diversity, it's excessive amounts of chemicals, this idea that beauty looked like one thing. And I was like, okay, Melissa, you're not a makeup artist, but you can still change this. So number one, having the mindset to go after entrepreneurship, I think is the biggest hurdle. Like choosing that you can be the change that you want to see. I think is number one. And then it's like, well, what do I do if I have nothing? I'm starting from ground zero. I have no money, I have no expertise, I have no team. But it's really that sheer determination that says, I wanna make sure that girls who look like me can grow up and know that they are beautiful and have that confidence that kept me going. 
So I was just a crazy learner. I started reading books on cosmetic chemistry. I started reaching out to mentors, cosmetic chemists, people who were in the beauty industry because what do I know? I'm like an Excel. I'm, I'm working on Wall Street. I don't know anything about makeup. And so I started making lipstick in my kitchen, not because like I thought that that was the best thing to do. I honestly thought it was my only option. And when you don't have resources, when you don't have mentorship, when you don't really know the path forward, you really just work with what you have. And I think that it is powerful, but also it can really hinder growth. And so for the first three years of the lip bar, I literally made every single product with my bare hands. People will say to me like, oh, Melissa, oh my God, I still have like one of those original lipsticks. Like I still have it. I'm like, please throw it away. It is moldy. <laughs> I did not know what I was doing. I wasn't using the right preservatives. Like you had to put that stuff in the refrigerator, but it's like, I was <laughs> seriously, but I was, I was so determined to go after more. And I know that women deserved more. We deserve to know that with or without makeup, we are enough. And I didn't see that in the industry. And so having that mindset to say, I can tackle anything and then having the scrappiness to go after your dreams was like my first big challenge and honestly it's still the challenge because you still have to convince yourself to go after your dreams the stakes are just higher that's amazing well you countered <laughs> that's right. you countered the barriers the obstacles that get put in front of so many women with that sheer determination but the know-how I mean I think that's what's so valuable I think for me it's very similar it's how do you get over failure and I think as an entrepreneur you are dealing with that on a daily basis and you have to learn that failure is a data point and you really need to move forward and similar to Sarah I would say product was um, the most important thing in the beginning that we had to figure out and when I started class pass in 2011 I worked for a year on a product that I thought was going to work and you know, we had press and I got into this huge tech incubator and I thought everything was going to work and we launch it and not a single person books a class. And it's absolute crickets. I'm calling my CTO, asking him, you know, is something wrong? Like is he not registering the data? And he's like, nope, there is nothing happening. Um, <laughs> once again, failure is okay. And you, you realize in that moment that you have to get back up. And I think I changed my mindset that day to not be product obsessed, but be mission obsessed. And I wanted to get someone to class, no matter what. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, because after that, we launched another product that also kind of didn't work, but that one at least had 20,000 reservations. And ClassPass, in the current form that most people know, has done over 100 million. And I think when you think of those, you realize that pivoting, changing, and iterating is such an important part of the entrepreneurship journey and to not get stuck. Because if I didn't keep moving, a lot of people wouldn't have worked out <laughs> and had the experience that they did. And you know, I think you asked the question of when did you know it worked? And I think there's this false conception that you need you know, hundreds of thousands of customers using your product to think it's working. And I remember I was also doing customer service, making every reservation for someone. It was when I got a few emails that people told me that this product changed their life and the way that they felt about working out. And when I, when I heard that, I remember in my heart knowing that I had reached the why I had started my product out for. And I think just don't ever give up on that why and keep going for it, even though it might take a little bit more time. Thank you so much, Paya. That's beautiful. <laughs> Natalie. Well, I think that I can echo what all of these beautiful women have said up here. I think that uh, for me, it was really based upon three things, purpose, passion, and perseverance. As women entrepreneurs, we must maintain all three and be very clear on all three of those, um, those very specific strategic uh, attributes that we are going to have to abide by as we move forward with our entrepreneurship. So my most difficult challenge was when I decided to go into LED lighting. I, you know, I'm an attorney by trade. I have no engineering background, no technical background whatsoever, but I had a passion 
for clean energy technology and I had that passion since I was, you know, an undergraduate stu student working for environmental justice nonprofit organizations. Uh, when I branched off, it was because of the passion from law to clean energy technology. And I decided that I really wanted to do something in the LED lighting field. And so I partnered with someone because I didn't know anything about it. Now, what ended up happening was that partner took all of my money and didn't show up with the lighting. And so it was my first big contract. And I'm sitting in the bed, and it's two o'clock in the morning, and I say to my husband, what am I gonna do? And he said, do it yourself. You have the ability to do this. You're smarter than them. You know, demystify the process. So in demystify, uh, uh, no pun intended, but a light bulb went off. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, wow, I, I think that I can do this for myself. And I researched. I became a student of that trade to find out everything that I needed to learn about it. And within two weeks, I was on a plane over to Asia, finding factories, how is going to OEM, and that was how I got into manufacturing. And really it was just a process of evolution and matriculation into knowing that I could do it. Knowing that I had the power within to be able to live out that passion with purpose and it required perseverance. It required a great deal of perseverance and belief in myself and so I think that overcoming that demystifying the process, and then having the courage to bet on me, to invest in myself, to take the time to learn, and to put actually my own money behind what we were actually doing, it let me to know that I could do anything that I put my mind to. Well, yes. You know, in um, talking about challenges, I mean, obviously our, our country has just gone through an enormous challenge for all of our entrepreneurs with the COVID pandemic. And, you know, clearly we talked earlier about the fact that, uh, you know, American Rescue Plan was so critical for our small businesses. And, you know, with the 300 million vaccinations that this administration was able to uh, deploy in the first 150 days, uh, you know, we, we saw we were able to go from, uh, you know, families stuck at home and closed businesses and closed schools, uh, kids not in their seats. And, you know, I think that uh, that has to have been one of the greatest challenges for all of you to navigate the pandemic and use your great experiences and the knowledge you gained from challenges to overcome. But, you know, I, I am curious, and, and I know, Melissa, you and I talked a little bit about this before in particular, but what did reopening uh, the economy uh, mean to you and your business? Yeah, so, I mean, makeup is non-essential, you know, and we had, you know... <laughs> On for the men, for the men. As much as I would love for everyone to wake up and put on their favorite lip bar lipstick, you know, the reality is we were all concerned. We were worried. We didn't know, you know, we, lipstick was the furthest from our concerns. You know, first it was toilet paper. <laughs> but, but the reality is, like, I am in the self-esteem business. You know, it's, it's less about the actual product and more about, you know, how people feel when they get up in the morning and how they are able to take on the day and power through their day. And if you're just at home, you know, on your Zoom, you feel less, less compelled to put on makeup. I mean, a lot of people weren't even putting on pants. And so <laughs> that, that being said, you know, we had our work cut out for us. We were, we were really trying to really drive this non-essential category in a way that reminded people of how to feel good and how to feel fully and wholly like themselves. So when the world opened back up, we are also based in Detroit. Hey, um, we have a small store in the heart of downtown Detroit and we had just opened it up in 2019 and then 2020 it shut down we are very fortunate that we're in retailers like Target and Walmart so those very essential stores were still open for us but our dot-com had had dropped 40 percent you know our store had completely that business had gone to zero so when the economy was stimulated when the world opened back up we had another lifeline 
You know, we had another story to tell. We were telling people, this is how you can get your makeup done in five minutes or less because I know that you guys have not been wearing makeup at all or just like putting on a little bit of lipstick just to show up on camera. And so when we when we thought about how to integrate into the lifestyles of our customers because the world had opened back up, we were able to tell a more authentic story, a story of women who had been teachers and tutors and chefs and, you know, moms, wives, all of the things for the past two years, we were able to say, hey, take a pause and show up for yourself in this moment. And that was all thanks to the world being back, open back up. That's amazing. Well, I mean, I think uh, the American Rescue Plan really delivered for, for our small businesses from my perspective, but I think uh, in, in how the administration has focused on pivoting and reinvesting in America to make sure uh, that there's a future that looks bright and full of possibilities uh, for more of our entrepreneurs. I mean, uh, you know, when President Biden signed the bipartisan infrastructure law, you know, he did set in motion one of the biggest investments uh, in history, you know, that America has ever seen in our critical system. So everything from clean water, which we all know is so critical, is, uh, you know, to our ports and bridges and to broadband, uh, which, of course, you know, ensures that our businesses can thrive online, um, you know, and EV charging stations as well. So, Natalie, um, you know, that means, but it also means that our supply chains are more stable, which I know, you know, all of you have had to deal with that. It's, you know, easier to grow through trade and e-commerce and bring customers from around the world when we have strong uh, infrastructure and investment in America. But I'm wondering, you know, as, as we look towards pivoting in another less and from the pandemic, uh, you know, how do these kinds of investments impact your business and your planning into the future? And, and, and Natalie, I think we should kick off with you because, you know, how should entrepreneurs be thinking about positioning themselves for these opportunities? Uh, it's an extraordinary time right now in this country. And really, we are in a fourth industrial revolution. And with that, there are so many opportunities. With respect to Dunamis Charge, uh, the bipartisan the bipartisan infrastructure law, as well as the uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, even the CHIPS Act, has a great impact on our company and the vision that we have for not only the company, but the communities that it will impact. So we intend to take full advantage and to participate in what this Biden administration has done with respect to the investment that is coming down the line for clean energy technologies. But with that, now we have the ability to go out and create jobs, green collar jobs, high paying jobs for individuals in all communities, black and brown communities. We have a very specific focus, is, focus on communities that have been historically impacted by environmental justice issues, to bring those people in to build the electric vehicle charging stations that we are making right in the city of Detroit. So there are not just direct opportunities, but there are ancillary opportunities that are coming from the investment that this administration has made. And what the SBA did for us in undergirding Dunamis Clean Energy Partners with the financial assistance through IDO and through the PPP loans was to help prepare us to take advantage of the investment that the Biden administration is, has, has made in clean energy tech. So I'm very, very excited. And with the CHIPS Act, I mean, for quite some time, we were really, really challenged with not being able to get microchips for our production. And we are very excited now so that we can not only build a product in America by American workers, but we now have the ability to utilize a supply chain that is also in this country so that Buy America, Build America aspect yep. will be able to incorporate. So, yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, my, our next goal will be helping Melissa and imagine her dreams around manufacturing in the U.S. as well. We need that. You know, I know that, um, you know, Sarah, well, all of you have talked about the fact that entrepreneurship is really not for the faint of a heart by really emphasizing uh, how the challenges meant that perseverance, that strength, that confidence that you had to build up uh, internally. And uh, as the uh, first self-made billionaire, Sarah Blakely, <laughs> um, you know, I, I know that uh, you, know, you have been an incredible inspirational role model, but I'm wondering, you know, because so often we talk about, you know, staying true to yourself and, and, and really uh, staying true to your vision and your mission. 
uh, you know, what do you think you discovered about yourself uh, in this process that you're particularly proud of or, you know, something that you've been able to work on and use to build strength? Well, when I first started Spanx, I was at a cocktail party and I had two um, gentlemen come up to me and they said, Sarah, we just read about you in the local paper. We heard you, you know, invented something. And I said, yes, I'm so excited about it. And one guy put his hand on my shoulder and said, great. Well, you know, business is war. And the other guy kind of laughed and, um, you know, nodded and they said, yeah, business is war. I hope you're ready to go to war. And I went back to my apartment that night and I sat on the floor of my apartment and I remember thinking, I don't want to go to war. Mm -hmm. like, why does it have to be war? Mm -hmm. And I was really determined to do it differently. And so I would say what I really learned about myself was, and, and what I utilized in my own journey was the feminine. And I think that we are all made up of masculine and feminine energy. We all have both inside of us. I'm deeply grateful for the masculine energy in me that helped me start Spanx, but I was not going to leave the feminine behind. And I feel like business for a long time has been set up to kind of minimize or squash the feminine. And so for 22 years, I owned 100% of Spanx on my own. I started it with five grand. Um, because of that, I think I had a real opportunity to honor my intuition which I think is a, a real feminine principle. So the guiding principles of my business and my journey were vulnerability, empathy, kindness, and intuition. And I can honestly say that for 22 years, I, I really put intuition above data and, and so much else. And I think it's a true superpower. Um, and you know, there's got to be an opportunity more for that to really have a place in business. Feminine intuition, I agree. Yeah, That's yeah. amazing. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Al, would you add to that anything? So I'll tell you all a little story uh, that President Biden alluded to, but about six months ago, I had the honor of performing here, right there, for the President, Vice President, and First Lady with my dance company. And the night before, I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, how did I get here with having the business accomplishments I had, and then having this artistic accomplishment. And in my head, I literally just kept going back to my journey. And I realized that both things were a decade in the making, which I think we forget sometimes that these things take a marathon. They are not a sprint. And I started on my journey you know, in 2010. I'd started my dance company three years before that. But I never gave up on my vision. And if you really read any of the mission statements of ClassPass or my dance company, I never wavered. And I think you're going to hear so many opinions from people. And the world's also going to change with trends, right? I remember whether it's my dance company should do hip hop or ClassPass should go into personal training, it, it's always people trying to move you towards what the trends of the universe are. And I wanted to stick to what I truly wanted to do. And I fought so hard being a petite Indian woman in any room I was in, I just stuck with it. And I used my voice and I never cared what anyone else was going to think and I went for it. And I think that is something that you have to develop and you just, I think over and over again, you, you learn to, if someone's talking over you, you keep talking. You know, it's, it's one of those things I have learned. If someone, you know, puts you in a seat that's lower, you go and put a book on there to go higher. <laughs> you know, I, I always made sure that I had a voice and that people could see me. And I think having the confidence, which we were talking a lot about before, too, is so important. It's, it's what you really feel inside when you walk into those rooms with whether it's venture capitalists or your, you know, other investors that you have or if you're meeting a partnership, you walk in there being all of you. And I think for me, you know, I even realized I have an artistic side to me and a business side to me. And, you know, as Sarah was saying, I think it's, it's putting it all together, you know, and being all of you in one place. I'm Indian, I'm American, I'm all these things, but I love being who I am fully. And the more environments I create where I can be all of me is where I'm going to succeed. That's beautiful. <laughs> I, I definitely want to hear the answer from each of you on this. So, Melissa, I know, you know from Wall Street to uh, starting your company, I mean, what did you discover about yourself that you're particularly proud of? Honestly, that I'm stronger than I thought I was. Um, so, you, Wall Street is a very masculine environment, and everyone thought that working on Wall Street was success but me. Everyone in my family was so proud of it, and I got there, and I didn't... <laughs> I didn't feel like I was being myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like 
I was truly serving my community, serving myself, serving my purpose. Um, and it took a lot of strength to walk away from, you know, this, this good paying job. Um, the only reason I had ever gone to Wall Street is because my goal was to live the American dream. And what I realized is that the American dream is not linear, that I have the ability to create my own version of the American dream. I just had to be strong enough to go after it. Um, so in starting my business, my business is now 11 years old, there have been many failures, um, some very public, some very private, but every single day something goes wrong, but I look at it as an opportunity to get better. Um, and every time something went wrong, I was able to build more armor or more knowledge that allowed me to persevere and build my business even better or build it with people who I actually liked. You know, no, seriously, pe people think that, you know, you have to follow these certain principles of business. But just like you can build your American dream in your own way, you can do that with your life, with your business, with your family, with your community. If you see something wrong, like, and if you feel that fire burning in the center of your belly, know that you are probably the person to do something about it. And so I learned my strength in this process. I also learned my, my options, and I got, I got a chance to really get clear with my voice and to remind other people that they, too, have a voice. That's beautiful. I love that. Natalie? Ditto, ditto, ditto. ditto, ditto. <laughs> um, I think that the main thing that I've learned about myself is that I'm fully equipped. I'm enough. And, and I think that that's really important for, for every beautiful woman that is in this room for you to know that you are enough and you're equipped with what it takes to do whatever you have a passion for, it's already in you. And like Melissa said, you know, there are a number of struggles, like everyone has, has stated up, up here. You know, we started with very, very humble beginnings. And um, if we listened to those that were telling us, no, you can't do that, or no, you shouldn't do that, or no, that's not gonna work, or no, this is too hard, so that means that you shouldn't do it then I wouldn't have Melissa on my lips and Sarah on my hips right now. <laughs> right now, as we speak. So. <laughs> yes. So I think that it's very important for us to understand, just as Sarah stated, women have a very special superpower, and that's the intuition, the gut that's in you to say, this is the way to go wait on this, and stop there, or move forward. And we should listen to that and we should trust that. And never despise the struggle because you're going to learn from it what is your growing edge. So when you fail, you're failing forward. You have the ability to take that lesson to grow and strengthen yourself. When you come up against opposition, when someone isn't believing in you, they're not supporting you, what is it that you're supposed to learn from that? Grow from that and keep moving forward. That's beautiful. Well, I think, you know, on that note, I always tell entrepreneurs that uh, you do the hard part. You came up with this amazing idea. You laid out the vision. Uh, you're working your business every day. Uh, but the SBA is here to help you. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, but I do think, you know, recognizing that, uh, you know, oftentimes there are people in our lives that helped, that helped us, whether that was the advice um, uh, of any of your fellow business people or what have you. And, and of course, the president just announced uh, that we're going to be expanding our women's business centers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, talked about the fact that we know that we need to open up access to capital markets so that we can invest in women because we're not investing enough in our women businesses to help them create the jobs that we know that they can. Uh, and so on that, I think, you know, maybe we'll start on, on the end this time uh, with Natalie going first, but just if you could share who or what helped you the most uh, as you were launching your business and, and uh, how do you pay it forward? Um, I would have to attribute that to my parents. Uh, they laid a foundation for me where I knew that no matter what, I was supported and that they believed in me. Uh, my father is, um, he's a pastor in the city of Detroit, 
And he would always say, and to this very day, says two things to myself and my three sisters. One, you're beautiful. And two, you can do anything.